Hi, we're in lovely Whitby here at Book Market, and I'm here with Pat Fluing, whose name I have finally gotten correct. Close. And how are you today? I'm doing just fine. How are you? I'm good. So set this up for me. Why are you here at this at this event? You know, uh, we are always looking for great places to introduce uh, writers to new readers and vice versa, especially if they're local, especially if they're Canadian. So what we found was there's a lot of good places to go for books, but they always tend to be in Toronto or in Kingston. They always seem to miss the Durham region. So um, we normally have Bookapalooza here in Whitby as well, Whitby, Oshawa, but it was much more of a focus on um, literature, like mainstream literature and biographies and so forth. We weren't finding a really good home for speculative fiction. So we decided, uh, Joe Mahoney and I, uh, actually it was Joe's idea to begin with, um, to have something that was much more speculative fiction that's available locally without having to drive all the way into Toronto. So why do you think there is that kind of divide between the literary and the speculative? That's a really good question. Sometimes I think it's about the, the image you as a reader are putting out. There could be a lot of mis, uh, misinformation about what genre looks like. Um, some people could think, well, science fiction is for, you know, people who live in their mom's basement. It's, that's not the case at all. Um, so one of the things that we're doing with Book Market as well is saying, no, you know, science fiction is about ideas. Crime fiction isn't lowbrow. There's actually a lot of work involved. There's a lot of psychology involved. There's a lot of research involved. So. It's, it's really a tough call. I think that we've been putting in so much effort into saying can lit is a thing, mainstream is the place to be, when we're kind of ignoring all of the other speculative genre type fiction. But we've seen that a lot of the mainstream authors uh, in, in Canada, the best-selling authors, Guy Gabriel mm -hmm. Kay, that's fantasy. Yep. Uh, Margaret Atwood has yep. been what I would call science fiction. Uh, and she would say so, too. Yeah, and Robert J. Sawyer, who's exactly. science fiction. So I think it is uh, part of the mainstream, so I am kind of surprised that you feel there is a divide. I'm seeing it uh, depending on where you go. Um, I mean, I know that you and I are, are much more in the science fiction community as well, so we're seeing a completely different audience. Uh, but when I go to other more literary events, I do see that divide. Um, it could just be a completely personal thing coming from science fiction, especially without having a really solid name behind me that I get to see a little bit more about that. Oh, I don't want to read horror because it's horror, right? Or I don't want to read science fiction because, you know, I don't like space things. I don't like aliens. It's, it's too out there for me. So... I guess it's really about who you who you talk with, the different audiences and the different communities that you get involved in. Let's talk about your own writing career. So yeah. what got you into that? How old were you when you started to write? <laughs> Seven. Seven. Seven years old, yeah. Um, started with just a 20-page story and then went on to novels from there. But it took me until what, about 25 years of trying to get published before I was actually published. So, so what kept you going in those 25 years? Stubbornness, for one part. But the other side of it was I realized, no, I have to have a story to tell to people, to have something to share. When I finally realized that it should be about an audience, it's about sharing an idea as opposed to me being a published author, when I made that shift, everything changed. And that's when I was finally able to get stories out there. So... Yeah, stubbornness, but also having that change of heart really helped. Now, uh, some of the books you brought here, so but I wanted to, so Helix. So this is a series that you started. Yep. Um, and and why that, and why the title Helix? Well, Helix, I actually came up with. Uh, we announced the title, and then shortly thereafter, there was a TV show that came out with Helix. Yeah. But um, a single strand of DNA is integral to the plot, so that's why it's Helix, not. Helixes or what have you. And, and you just decided not to use a single strand. Uh, that didn't work as a title. No. no. Too many words in it. It was, it was too much, yeah. But uh, it was originally just Helix, and then we realized, well, if it's going to be a series, we might as well have a, a series name, and that's where Helix came from. So. Okay, so you, did you begin it as a series, or did you think, here is my first novel, or did something... Oh, no, it was... Uh, they all kind of came out of me very quickly. Um, the original idea 
came when I was supposed to be focusing on my psychology lecture, but my professor was really interested in ants. So he's talking about ants. I'm not paying attention. We're supposed to be talking in psychology. And all of a sudden, I had this idea of, you know, if we did this, that could work. And that's when I got the original idea for the science, the pseudoscience behind the series. The original book, believe it or not, I wrote in 72 hours. 300 pages in 72 hours through the Muskoka Novel Marathon. It was my first time there. And it was crap. But fortunately, I've had really good editors who have walked me through the process. But before I even sold, I actually had the other two written already. So the first three were already ready to go. The fourth one was kind of a last minute idea after the third book was done. I'm really fascinated about the marathons because there's the three day writing yeah. competition, the three day writing Labor weekend, day. which happens on Labor Day. We also have the 24 hour comic, which mm -hmm. people who can write and draw, write and draw a comic in 24 hours both of which seem impossible to me. So how do you do that? Like, do you stock, go to your fridge, stock it up with everything <laughs> you're going to need? Like, it just seems to be impossible to even think you could write a novel in 72 hours. You'd be amazed. So the one that I do is Muskoka Novel Marathon, and it happens around July every year up in Huntsville. And we actually raise money for literacy programs through the YMCA Simcoe Muskoka. And it's not just one person who goes. We actually have, on average, about 40 people uh, a couple of years ago, we actually raised $36,000 between the 40 of us for literacy programs, which is phenomenal. But on the day of the event, well, actually the weekend of the event, we're all sitting in the same room together. And there's so much crosstalk and, and energy in the room. And just sitting there, seeing everyone else inspired and typing away encourages you to do the same thing. And off hours, you get to talk with other writers, you work out plot wait, wait, wait. Uh, There are no off hours. No, there's right. no, well, eventually your brain kind of goes and then you're done. So you step out and you talk with other okay. people and it, it's like coals together. You know, okay. when you put coals together, they, they keep each other warm. You take those coals apart and you lose that heat. And that's really what the marathon is about is keeping each other inspired for those 72 hours and encouraging people and goofing off when necessary. It's all about barbecue coals. I didn't realize it was all going to come back to that. It's all That's about the barbecue. Oh, <laughs> and now I'm hungry. Thanks. Um, so now that fascinates me. And then you've also been involved and written short stories as well, mm -hmm. including for Tesseracts. Tell me about this yeah. new volume of Tesseracts, which is Nevertheless. Nevertheless is a, a wonderful project, and I think it's very timely. It's optimistic science fiction stories. Uh, <laughs> one of the reviews was, it's the darkest optimism we've ever read. And apparently mine was the most optimistic in the whole set. But I think especially now, you know, we live in the dystopia that we envisioned. There's a lot of people who are saying that we are living in Gilead now with Handmaid's Tale. We're seeing a lot of that developing now. We don't always want to live in that dystopia. We can only survive so much of it until we have an escape. And I think that optimistic science fiction is that escape that we need now. Because it encourages people to imagine a better world. If we can't see a better world, we can't make a better world. We can only survive what we got. So have we fallen back from the future? I mean, I'm, I was born in the 50s. So when I grew up, it was all about space and, and technology. And, you know, you, you had movies where somebody would say, do you want to know what the future will be? Plastics. You know, it was that kind of a shiny, yep. optimistic future. I grew up in that. I, that. That was where I came from. Have we fallen back from the future, do you think? Oh, I think it might be a generational thing, too. For me, our, our science fiction was, we had the Blade Runners. We had the dystopian already. But at the same time, one of my most foundational memories was the time that the Berlin Wall fell. We had grown up knowing only a life in the Cold War. And all of a sudden, the Cold War went away. But we still have trials and tribulations and everything else. So we have kind of both those sides. And I think that's why it's dark optimism. But... What I'm also seeing now is a lot more solar punk. So solar punk is the, the opposite of dystopian fiction, where you can see a more of a utopian environment, not necessarily a uh, utopian government, but imagine science fiction with, like we were discussing earlier about Swamp Thing, about renewal. Imagine a world in the future where there are trees growing off buildings, or imagine where there's no fossil fuels. That kind of thing. You can still have an exciting adventure in that world, but 
just to be able to imagine a time when you can go outside and breathe the air or eat food or not have to worry about people not having medical attention because they can't afford it. That's the science fiction that I want. And I think that's really resonating with the younger generation now as well. That is our future. So are we really falling back from the future? No, I think we're just taking a different path. This is a different future. No, I, I have an interesting take on it. I, I, obviously, my future is the one that I thought of when I was 12. Isn't it the golden age of science fiction is mm -hmm. when you're 12? But, uh, but I have, I'm not really that familiar with the modern optimistic future. Um, most of the books that I've been reading have been either horror or, mm -hmm. or dystopia. Um, or, you know, th well, even Harry Potter is very, very dark to me. Yeah. Hunger Games is very, very, very dark. dark. And a lot of the other YA trilogies are very dark. Yeah. So I haven't seen this next trend yet. And, and this one, it's a real shame, too, because there's so much more interesting takes on the future. And I think, especially now, you, you read so much dystopian f fiction, what hope do you have, right? I mean, if, you, if that's the, word that, the world that you're envisioning, do you really want to get to that future? Do you want to strive for that future? The, what you were talking about with the, you know, the space travel and the plastics and innovation, we wanted to get there, and we got there, right? I mean, take a look at Star Trek, flip phones. Somebody had an idea of saying, hey, that's really cool, let's build a flip phone, and we got the flip phone. Somebody said, hey, you know what? Having all of your music on a computer is a great idea. So we invented MP3s. If we envision it, we can go there. Now we've seen where plastics leave us. So if we can envision a world beyond capitalism, beyond plastics, we can move toward that. And I think that's where I'm seeing a lot of uh, really young crowds going toward. They want to see a, a world beyond guns. Hmm. Let's give them something other than that. Uh, the other two things that I'm seeing are the rise of, one is the e-book, mm -hmm. and the other one is the internet. So, yes. uh, so fiction on the internet and the e-book. How is, uh, as somebody who is a championing, or so, as someone who is championing Canadian literature and yep. speculative fiction, how do those fit into your kind of worldview, the e-book and the internet? I'm not really seeing a big difference, honestly. There are people who prefer e-books, but there's a way to do that. Um, we're building out our online catalog, which means that people can go on their phones to our website and be able to start buying ebooks right then and there. So they can browse the hard copy. I want that. They go online, they buy it. Um, we can even use QR codes that will take you from your phone to Amazon, for example, and you can buy the ebook right there. It's not a matter of technology replacing anything. I sell as much in paper as, as ever because people do still, people like vinyl, yeah. right? But we shouldn't be afraid of the technology, we should be adapting to the technology. I would rather see that we can offer both hard copy and ebook than play one off the other. Why? Get twice as many sales by doing both. Well, it's like the DVDs that have the digital code in them as exactly. well, so you could do that. Um, so what's the website you want to drive people to? Uh, we are going to uh, overhaul www.mythhawker.ca. Okay, so my final question today, yeah. so what advice would you have to the aspiring writer coming up? So uh, I was kind of implying it earlier that the biggest lesson that I've ever had was shifting from writing a book to telling a story. And the difference is with the writing of a book, you are writing words on a screen or on a page or whatever, you're telling yourself a story. But when you move to sharing an idea or sharing a story with an audience, even if it's a single person, it changes your style entirely. It changes your whole purpose. You move beyond, I want to be a rich and famous author so I can do this all day, to I want to communicate something. And it makes all the difference in the world. So my rule of thumb is, especially for short stories, if I can tell you the short story at a cafe or at a bar or a restaurant, whatever, then I have a really good story. Because now I can see how you're reacting to it. And storytelling is an art that we need to bring back. Not just writing stories, fan fiction is wonderful as well. But for me and you to share an anecdote is a powerful thing. That's how we make the human connection. And if you are only writing a story for your own sake, go for it. But if you want to do well, if you want to respond with an audience, you have to make that connection with the audience. 
Thanks very much, Pat. Thank you. Yay. Yay.